Welcome to the Cross Line Podcast, another special episode. We are here at the Ice House Comedy Club in Pasadena, California. And with the first on set comedian, Tammy T. Love, how you doing? I'm good. How you guys doing? Doing well. We appreciate you taking the time to sit with us. So, like you said, you were the first on on the show. Like, how was that? Uh, how was that? Was it added pressure, you know, being the first one? No, not, not anymore. It used to be when I first started doing it um, because you don't know what the audience, you know, if they're going to pay attention or they ordering their food, but, and they still coming in. Right. So you got those distractions. Mm-hmm. But so yeah. if you do bad, then everybody got to work hard. If you do great, then everybody could just ride off of that energy. Right. Describe, you know, when we first got here, we didn't know where we were going to set up mm-hmm. at. But then we went in the, into the green room with everybody else. Like, how right. was that, you know, being in that room with the other female comedians? Like, how It's dope because we're always so surrounded by male comedians. Right. So, you know, when we can get together and have just our girl comedian talk without a male comedian coming in, you know, saying something obnoxious. Right. It, it was, it's a good camaraderie. And all those women are funny. So, Absolutely. what you going to see tonight? So, you are I knew, I knew D-Lo and T. So during the festivals, I tell comedians all the time to get into the festivals because that's a great way of networking. And it makes it easier to get booked when you go to a different state or a different city. So talk, speaking about, you know, doing the festivals, are you... Are there people just that comes out like maybe like agents or somebody that are coming out looking for you? Or is it kind of like word of mouth where, where the, the fans here and the audience they come out and spread the word about how how great your set was? You never know who's in that audience. Mm-hmm. You know, every time you get on stage, it's a different audience. You don't know who these people are. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so every time you get on that stage, you just make sure you have fun, be yourself, and you put on the best show that you you could do. And whatever happens after that, you know, that's right. God given. Let's take take me back a little bit, so because I, I want the audience to, to know a little bit more about your work. Can you tell everybody who, like where you're originally from? Uh, originally, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Okay. Raised in Los Angeles, and I got my game from the Bay, Oakland. Okay. And I've been to all three of those <laughs> places now. I, I went to uh, well, I was in New York mm-hmm. um, last year for the first time. Um, it just it was just. The, the traffic out there yeah. is what I don't Because like. they can only drive like 25 miles yeah. an hour. And the roads there oh, are horrible. Terrible. There's yeah. some of the worst roads. And then I went to the Bay Area for the first time like two years ago. The roads are terrible. Yeah. But you could drive faster. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> but we had some good food out there. Yeah. And then I, that was the first time, you know, being in South Carolina, we see a lot of homeless people. Not not to get away from your story. We'll no, no, no. It's, it's true. But, um... Like, that was the first time I really saw, like, a lot of homeless people, like, in the Oakland, because we rode by a park, and it was just, like, tents just set up everywhere. Down, and like, you know what? I've been living in Oakland since 96. Mm-hmm. This is the first time I'm seeing this many homeless people. Out really? Oakland. Yeah. Man. It's so, never been like this before. So we, I mean, we have homeless people, like, in South Carolina, but it's, like, spread out. Like, you might see one here at a light holding a sign. Because there's a lot more land. Yeah. Here in the Bay, you got, in the Bay, it's, um... It's almost like an island. Mm-hmm. You got Oakland is almost a little island, and then it breaks off, and then you got San Francisco across the street is mm-hmm. another little island. Right. So the rent went from eight fifty nine hundred to three thousand. It's insane. No, yeah. within thirty days. Oh, that's crazy. Right. So a lot of people went from paying nine hundred a month to paying. Telling them they got to pay 3000 a month. Mm-hmm. A lot of buildings got set on fire. Um, a lot of people got evicted because of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. So all these, you know, disasters yeah. that happened caused all these people you to know, be homeless. You know, we do have a lot of people who come to South Carolina um, that move from the West Coast. And they say one of the biggest reasons is like the cost of living, mm-hmm. how everything is just so expensive, and then you know, just different policies and taxes and all that yeah. type of stuff. And when they come then uh, to South Carolina, like what you can pay in a the mortgage there is a, a oh oh yeah, wage. A, um, to rent a one bedroom, four hundred fifty square foot, it's like two, three thousand a month, Mm-mm. and you that's not including water, um, parking, gas, and all the that's other stuff. Crazy. Man, that's 
That's insane. And then you got to get to work. And if you're crossing the bridge, you got to pay $7 to get across that bridge every time. Ooh, but I, I guess... Gas is $7. Yeah, I, I guess <laughs> if... I'm assuming, like, maybe, like, if you live and you born and raised here, you kind of get accustomed to it. So, like, for us, you know, living and being in South Carolina, and then we come over here and see the prices, we're like, man, this is crazy to see these type of houses. But you, what you getting when you come over here? You getting beautiful weather. Yeah, you do. You getting yeah. beautiful women. That's you true. get to smoke your weed wherever you want to. You know that's what the saying? only thing we'll have. I mean, we got a little bit of everything. Also, up, but, but you get in Hollywood. Yeah, that's true. You know what I mean? So you getting, you're paying for the experience of living in California. Yeah, I've right. tried to move out and nowhere, I, I don't feel comfortable nowhere else. Mm -hmm. And I don't like the snow. So I'm right. not going to move back to New York because I'm not going to be snowed in. That's just dumb. Right. <laughs> and then you know, the South, I'm not moving to the South because racism yep it's understandable <laughs> so you know the california la and you know the bay area is i could be myself i don't have to retrain people about who i am but as far as i like, can walk the streets comfortably but as far as comedy it's just like the premier spot that, would, that you would say is like to be here like if you, if oh you yes you're definitely comedy, if you want to really get deep into comedy be the, what was told to me be the best in your city mm -hmm. then come here at, to get in these festivals, gradually come. It, it's a slow process. Mm -hmm. I've been doing it five years, and it's not an overnight thing. Because every time you think you made it, it's like, well, it's something else. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? There's somebody else funnier than you right, right now. <laughs> what would you say was the first time like that you kind of like actually got exposed to comedy? You know. In Kind of like found, kind of found that it's like your passion. You remember when that moment? I was, uh, I was um, pushed into comedy. I had a comedian friend. He did uh, house parties like for a month. Mm -hmm. uh, one Thursday a month, he throw house parties just for me to talk on the mic. He introduced me to another comedian um, who put on a show for me. But before I can do that show, I met the Monique. Okay. Queen of comedy mm -hmm. at okay. San Jose Improv as a regular patron. Um, during the show, we had dialogue. I told her I was an inspiring comedian after the show, and she gave me 10 minutes um, to open up for her on her next show that started oh, 20 minutes after. What, what was that like to, you know, get that warm embrace for, from her? You know? It was amazing, you know, and that's just a long, beautiful story cut very short. Mm -hmm. But it was amazing because I had never done comedy. I just did a couple of house parties and an open mic. Mm -hmm. And then um, I met her and she gave me 10 minutes. So that was the very first time you did a, like an actual like set? Yeah. For, and that was for her? Yeah. And that was big, right? Uh, Paul Mooney was in the audience. It was sold out. Mm -hmm. um, I did my 10 minutes. I uh, got off stage and she said she was taking me on tour. Oh, man. Yeah. And how was that experience? You it know? was amazing. I learned so much. I was on tour with her and uh, Tone X. Okay. Um, and let, let me not mention, Tim Jackson was the man that introduced me and put me into it. And then he introduced me to Tony Sparks. Okay. Tony Sparks is another legendary comedian in the Bay Area. Did one open mic with him. He put me on a show that I didn't get to do um, before I met Monique. Okay. Once I met her, I did his show, and then I've been doing that ever since. When did you feel like you, you probably found yourself like as a comedian like when you find yourself, I'm still like, I'm still searching you know every time I get on stage I see something different or I find something different I come up with something different I, I realize something different that I do something that I probably shouldn't do no more like why are you doing that mm -hmm. so you learn every time you get on that stage it's a learning process doing these type of festivals is it hard to you know get those jokes because you only have like a, a set amount of time and you share that stage with so many different comedians is it hard for you to kind of like find no your you just focus on you you mm -hmm. can't worry about who's coming after you or who's coming before you all you gotta mm -hmm. do is worry about your energy what you gonna put out there and what you gotta say mm -hmm. um i do think i was up there longer than five minutes but i didn't see nobody gave me the light mm -hmm. so um you just do you, and you don't stop until you see that light. Mm -hmm. Have fun is the key. Oh, that's, that's always the key. <laughs> have fun. In, in anything that yeah, you do. Yeah, have fun. What would you say is the, for you, would be like the hardest part of being a comedian? 
Um, it, everything in life is going to be hard mm -hmm. at some point. You know, I don't think it's one thing that makes it hard for me to be a comedian. Um, Cause I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be me. I'm 52 years old, so what can I complain about at this point? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I've, I've, I've did the mil, I was in the military. You know, I survived the LA riots, riots working in the military. Mm. So I've done so much in 52 years that. I mean, if it's hard, then it can't be no harder than sleeping in a truck. <laughs> we we have people, you know, um, back home, you know, they some people are, are afraid to go after their dreams and their vision, and some are, um, they, they express themselves, to, that goes to their family and friends. When you told people that you wanted to be a comedian, like, what was... Um, I didn't tell them. Oh, you, know, you didn't? Remember I told you this was... You Put, put on me. You used to put something put on you. Yeah, I didn't tell anybody because I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I used to joke outside the club and I used to always perform. You know, mm -hmm. I, I used to dance like Michael Jackson. I ain't finna hold you. Okay. <laughs> I, ain't finna, I used to get paid to dance like Michael Jackson. I used to break dance, play basketball. I was an athlete. So I was always doing something, drama mm -hmm. class, always doing something. But comedy chose me. You know, I didn't, you know, go out and seek to do it. So now I'm in a, still in a learning process while I'm going, hands on. How often do you get a chance to um, to perform, like, when you, as a comedian, like, how often do you try to, like, get those reps in? And do oh, I'm shows? on stage pretty much four days, five days a week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's necessary, would you say that's, like, you would recommend other comedians do the same thing just to get those reps in? And well, if um, luckily I'm booked okay. for those days. Um, even if it's a small show, you know, it don't have to be 500 people. It could be sometimes it's 25. I did a show yesterday, it was like 30 people in there. But it was a nice, small, intimate room. So sometimes I'm on stage five, six times a week. It depends. Mm -hmm. A room with 30 people, or it may be higher, more than that, 2x more than that. Like, is your mindset still the same? Like, wherever you go, like, I don't care how many people are in the audience, like, I'm still gonna go out here and just do what I have to do. Every time I get on that stage, I get on that stage like I'm opening up for the queen. Mm -hmm. Every time. Every time I get on that stage, I get on there like, I don't know who these four people are. Right. These could be some very powerful four people. I don't know. They came to have fun. Absolutely. So we're gonna have fun. Yep. Uh, I may not do my written material. I may just do crowd work or uh, just go off the energy of the room. We may have just a conversation. Yeah. It's a different um, path you take or I take yeah. uh, when it's a small audience. Um, but like tonight, yeah. I did some material and some was off the top. Yeah, that's what I was gonna ask. Like, do you have to? You so you read the room first to see like what kind of jokes you want to tell. Like, you may have something in mind, but then once you get a feel for the room, then you change your, your jokes. Is that what you do? I don't change, but sometimes what I have planned, when I get on that stage, it may change by just me wiping the microphone off. Mm -hmm. Somebody may say something, and that may change the whole dynamic of where we're going. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the energy that I get once I get up there. Absolutely. Once I get up there and I get that energy, like, okay, this is where we're going. I got a few more questions and we'll wrap it up. I really appreciate you taking time. To oh, it's all it. good. I'm here till tomorrow. Oh, okay. <laughs> How does it make you feel to see people come out and support you and look to you? I tell you a story. I was in Vegas and this couple, they were sitting there and they was like looking at me the whole time, but they was expressionless. And after I got off stage, they was just so welcoming and they was like, oh my goodness. And the father wanted to call his daughter. He was like, I want to call my daughter. Mm. And I was like, okay. So he called her on FaceTime. She looked just like me with a do-rag on. Mm. And I said, I get it. And I talked to her and I said, your father never seen a dyke before. Mm. The only dyke he know is you. Mm. And he didn't understand you, but he understand you now. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully they got a better relationship, offer him understanding. Whatever he felt his daughter was can be so much more if he support her. Was that something that you um, were very open about when you first started doing um, comedy? Yeah, 100%. Well? 
I wanted to tell my story, and that was something um, Tone X, Monique, Tim Jackson, and Tony Sparks drilled into me that you got a story to tell and tell it because you're going to touch some people out there that you don't even know you're going to touch. Absolutely. My, my final two questions for you. What advice would you have for anybody that's just pursuing their dreams? Maybe not in stand-up comedy, just want to pursue their dreams. Um, what advice would you give to those people? If you could dream it, you could be it. I mean, mm -hmm. daydreaming is not a mistake. You know what I'm saying? Unless you just daydreaming about stupid stuff. Right. You know, if you set your mind to whatever you doing right now for free, that you just do for no reason for free, that is what you're supposed to be getting paid for. Mm -hmm. All the times I was joking outside the club and talking and, and just making jokes in class, that's what I was supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. But if I, if that talent isn't nurtured by the parents, heterosexuals, mm -hmm. <laughs> if it's right. not nurtured by you all, then it's not going to get done. Stop beating your children down for the identity that you think right. they should of, have. Yeah, exactly, because a lot of times parents put what they, may, maybe something that they want to do in right. life, they put that on their child right. and have those expectations on them. Because soon as the baby, so, oh, the baby is in there, and oh, I can't wait, you're going to be this, and you're mm -hmm. going to be, you've already planned that child's life, exactly. and when that child gets here, you forget that's a whole different person. Exactly. That's not you. You got to let that person be that person. Mm -hmm. As long as you guide that person into being a great person, let them go. Absolutely. Because you don't want them to grow up with resentment and saying, this is not something that I really want to do. It's something that the parent forced on me. Right. And, you know, that's. I think that's a lot of, like, this generation now is like you it just they, society in general. This generation is noticing their talents early mm -hmm. and they're not letting anybody stop them from being who they are. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate important. that. Yeah, because like, I, I tell people all the time, you know, I started my own business, but when I grew growing up, I just saw my parents get up and go to work. So I just thought that's, that's what, what I was, I was supposed, supposed to do. do. Yeah. Yep. And then I read this book. Poor, rich Dad, Poor Dad. That, that's the first book oh, that changed everything I put for me. that book. I was so angry. Robert Kiyosaki. Because Sophie, I was yep. like, this is this is exactly what they did. Yep. Go to school. Go. My parents told me go to school. Get out. Go to school, get out. Get a job. Get out. You're 18. And that's what we tend to do with our kids, and we gotta stop doing that. Exactly. That that was the book I will, I never forget when I graduated from college and I, I wrecked my told them my my first car, and when I went to the dealership to get my second one, the guy was like, you know what? He said, young, just whatever you do in life, don't settle. And uh, he told me two books to get, and Rich Dad Poor Dad was one of them. Mm -hmm. And when I read it, I was just like, man, this is like, crazy. I feel like I was programmed to do something. I was like, I feel like I've been living wrong the whole the time. The whole time. And it just make you question a lot of stuff. Because I had already bought a house. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I wasn't supposed to do this yet. Yeah. <laughs> It's a, it's a lot to yeah. go into it, but that's a, yeah. it, it, to me, reading is pivotal. Like, yes. outside, of, since I graduated from college, I've read more books since I graduated from college than I had my whole entire... Pick up, if you could find this book, but this book is... Uh They have a special area in the library. I don't know if anybody listening knows this. There's a special area in the library that you cannot remove those books. Mm. You have to read those books in that area. You can't take pictures or anything out of those. Those are the books that tell the actual truth of everything. Mm. And there's a book called Our Roots Run Deep. Our Roots Run Deep. I'm, I'm typing that right It's now. expensive, and mm. they do not want you to have that book. Mm -hmm. um, that's and, the type of information that we yeah. need. Mm -hmm. There's a book called Slave Testimony. It's, it's about this, this thick, mm -hmm. and it's written testimonies of slaves. And um, of course, Malcolm X. I, I'm, oh, that's, right. that's one of the. Asada Shakur. Okay, okay. Definitely read Asada Shakur. I gotta get that one as well, but yes. I definitely read Malcolm X. You see how far ahead of the time he was, things that he even spoke about back then, and you see some of it still true to this day. Yep. But, and you can see why. Even Farrakhan. Farrakhan is not allowed to speak on social media. Yeah, oh, yeah. They, they sound the platforms and That's everything. The, those, those are people I grew up on. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So just keep doing what y'all doing, man. I appreciate you for having Absolutely. me. Absolutely. My, my last and final question, you know, when we're on the road and we interview entrepreneurs and people who are pursuing their dreams, my, the, the last thing I love to ask everybody at the end is what does self-investment mean to you? Self-investment? Man, whatever, whatever you choose 
what is advancing in your life. Everybody's definition of success is different. Mm -hmm. Because I done talked to a lot of homeless people that think they successful. You know what I'm saying? I done talked to a lot of homeless people that living in some fancy tents that think that is the level of success. Mm -hmm. So it's your choice. You know, for me, just waking up every morning, I'm 52. I'm happy to be here. You know what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm, I done seen a lot. So my level of success, I've already exceeded it. Absolutely. I've done so much, got so many awards that, shit, I'm chilling. Yeah. <laughs> Tammy T, Tammy T, love, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate, I appreciate it. it. Thank you for sharing your story. Yes. Before we get out of here, can you please tell everybody how to find you? Yes, uh, Instagram at the real Tammy T Love, the real Tammy T A M M Y T E A L O V E, and uh, my website tammyt.com, and check me out. You got videos, and it's also the same on YouTube. Absolutely. So we hope you guys in- enjoyed this episode of the Cross the Line podcast here at the. The Ice House Comedy Club in Pasadena, California. So till next time, keep chasing your dreams. Thank you for listening.